A Women's Significance in Society, How and Why Did Society's Perceptions of Women Change from the Aztec Empire to Spanish Rule in Colonial Mexico? So really, the reason why I chose this topic was in our Colonial Latin American History class, I found it very interesting that Aztec women appeared to have um, a lot of autonomy. And then as soon as they were conquered by the Spanish, it seemed like all that autonomy dwindled. So I really just wanted to research this under, uh, to understand why each society perceived women's roles differently. So then um, this led me to my two research questions. So the first one is, why did the Aztec and colonial Mexican societies not value women as much as they valued men? And then what institutions were in place in each society that led to the inferiority of women? So then through this came my thesis. So although women generally perform similar tasks in pre-Columbian and post-conquest Mexican societies, the Aztecs and Spanish valued women's roles differently. The way that both the Aztecs and colonial Mexican societies thought of women's roles was shaped by two factors, religion and a woman's place on the social hierarchy. The Aztecs had an indigenous religion that allowed for considerable female autonomy, while the Spanish practiced Catholicism and relatedly the patriarchy that called for harsh female subordination. The Aztec social hierarchy was based off of wealth and status of being either a noble or a commoner, while the Spanish hierarchy was based off of class and race. So then first, I just want to go into a little bit of historical background. So to begin, we're going to start with the Aztecs. So in the Aztec society, interactions between men and women was based on the principle of gender complementarity. So basically, this defines male and females as distinctive but equal independent parts of a larger productive body. So basically, the Aztecs understood that in order for their society to flourish, they needed contribution from both men and women. And so then also family was the basic unit in Aztec society. Uh, male and females did have different roles. So male activities included farming and fishing, while female activities included weaving and cleaning. So this can be depicted below. So this is a drawing. Um, and so it shows a, um, a father teaching his son how to fish and then a mother teaching her daughter how to weave. And so in the Aztec society, um, the parents really taught um, the same sex children like this is what you're going to do when you grow up because obviously the men fish so they would teach their sons to fish and so then also women who died during childbirth were given the same value that was given to aztec warriors who died on the battlefield so basically the aztecs really understood how important childbirth and reproduction was and just really how challenging it was for females so really put a lot of distinction into that so then moving along to colonial Mexico. So motivation for conquering the Aztecs stemmed from their earlier expulsion of the Moors in the late 1400s. So the Moors invaded North Africa and conquered much of Spain uh, in the eighth century um, in an effort to expand the Islamic faith. So after years of little effort by the Spanish um, and the other Christian nations that kicked the Moors out, the Spanish finally launched the Reconquista in order to rid um, the Islamic faith from the Iberian Peninsula. And so the conquistadors who reached Mexico really built off their experience from conquering the Moors. And so the Spanish essentially used the same ideology um, in their conquest of the Latin American peoples as they did during the Reconquista. So then population of Aztec territory in 1519 was 1 1.6 million. And then in 1521, that dwindles all the way down to 900,000. So the Aztecs had obviously been decimated more from smallpox and disease than they had actual warfare. But these demographics likely just made it easier for the Spanish to come in and assert their ideals just because the Aztecs had such few people um, to really go in and defeat not only the Spanish, but also their allies. And so then also, I'll touch more on patriarchy later in my presentation, but um, it's important to understand how deeply entrenched patriarchy was in Spanish society. And so um, Catholic patriarchy was the belief of men in society that women must be kept under control. And they actually believe that basically only when placed under male's religious guidance could a woman's sexuality be prevented from wreaking havoc on society. So then moving along to my historiography, um, so for the Aztecs, it was really um, hard to find primary sources written by Aztec women just because they couldn't read or write. Um, so I was kind of limited in that aspect, but I was able to find one primary source. It's titled Advice of an Aztec Mother to Her Daughter. Um, and so this was really telling because it, it showed me that while 
obviously Aztec women did have more autonomy than women in colonial Mexico. They still weren't free to do whatever they wanted. They still did have restrictions placed upon them. So in this letter, this mother is telling her daughter um, how to act in public. She says, don't raise your voice. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. She tells her to not wear makeup because that's the mark of vile women. She's just really giving her daughter advice and just says, don't draw attention to yourself. So then also paintings, photographs, and drawings were uh, very helpful. And so um, the drawing on the bottom left is an Aztec woman doctor tending to a man who has smallpox. And so this just really goes to show that Aztec women were allowed to have those higher up occupations that women in colonial Mexico were not allowed to have. And so then also there's a photograph on the bottom right. Um, so in my research, I learned that weaving was a big aspect of the Aztec economy and Aztec women, regardless of social class, spent a decent amount of their day weaving. And so this is actually a picture um, from it uh, that an archaeologist took of an Aztec burial site. And so this uh, Aztec woman was buried with a spindle whorl, which was the tool used for weaving. So it really just goes to show how important weaving was to the Aztec woman identity. So then moving along, um, uh, colonial Mexican primary sources. So the first one is Victors and Vanquished, edited by Stuart B. Schwartz. So this is a primary source account. It has letters and diaries from Spanish conquistadors, such as Hernan Cortez and Bernal Diaz. And so in one account, um, Hernan Cortez is writing to Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. He was describing his experiences um, that he was having in the Aztec society. And so in one of them, he uh, describes the different attire that Aztec women wore. So commoner women, he remarked wore more multicolored, very flashy robes, while the elite women wore bodices of fine cotton. And he actually compared that to what the bishops in Spain wore. So it just goes to show that um, you could tell what social class a woman was a part of in Aztec society just by what she was wearing. So then um, next is On Men's Hypocrisy by Sor Juana. So Kendall will give you more uh, detail on Sor Juana a little bit later, um, but really she's one of the most notable females to speak out against the Catholic Church. So in her work On Men's Hypocrisy, she details the double standard that men and women lived, and then she also blames men for the harsh conditions that women live. And so at this time, obviously the Catholic Church had so much power that it was very rare for people to speak out against it. So I felt that her that this work was very important to include in my research. So then um, moving along um, for my secondary sources, I broke them up into four parts. So the first one is sources that provide a brief and concise description about everything related to colonial Mexican society. So these are sources such as Spain and America by Charles Gibson and then Mexico under Spain, 1521 to 1556 Society and the Origins of Nationality by Peggy K. Liss. And so these um, sources tended to be a little bit older. And so they're just uh, sources who that described everything about colonial Mexican society. So it described how their economy worked, who ran the government, their relationships to other civilizations. So it was very um, broad. So I had to use other sources to kind of supplement what was in those. And so the next is sources that analyze the Catholic Church and the Spanish patriarchy. So the American Catholic Experience, A History from Colonial Times to the Present by J.P. Dolan and Women in the Crucible of Conquest, <clears throat> The Gender Genesis of Spanish American Society by Karen Vera Powers. So Dolan's source really hones in specifically on the colonial period and the Catholic Church in colonial Mexico following the Spanish conquest, whereas Powers really um, identifies and looks into the Spanish patriarchy and how women were affected by that. Um, so then also sources that are dedicated to the Aztec empire. So these are sources such as the Aztecs by Richard Townsend and the Aztecs by Michael E. Smith. And so these sources were just really helpful in determining the lifestyle of the Aztecs, as well as like, examining their indigenous re uh, religion and the Aztec social hierarchy. And so then lastly, sources that focus on the lives of women during the Aztec Empire and post-conquest societies. So these are sources such as Aztec Women and Goddesses by Miriam Lopez Hernandez and the Women of Colonial Latin America by Susan Migdon Soclo. And so women's studies is becoming increasingly popular. So these uh, sources were definitely um, more recent that I used. Um, and so basically these sources just describe uh, how women lived in these societies, what occupations they had, things like that. And so where I kind of fit into all this is I'm really um, compiling all this information from these sources to understand not only what women's roles in were each society, but to understand more thoroughly the perception that society had towards women and why that was, and then obviously comparing and contrasting the two societies. 
So then moving along to my research, I argue that there were two main factors that influenced the treatment and worth of women in each society, and social status is one of them. And I argue that social status led to the inferiority of both, as, uh, both women in the Aztec and colonial Mexican societies. So um, in terms of the Aztec social status, um, there were two social classes, uh, nobles and the commoners. So the nobles were the people who ran the government, they owned the land, commanded the armies, uh, while the commoners were people who served the nobles and had to pay the nobles tribute. So then also a woman's status would vary according to her class, age, and individual characteristics. So commoner women spent a lot of their time cooking and preparing goods while elite women, you know, had servants conduct this for them. But um, also uh, women, regardless of social class, wove a decent amount throughout the day just because it was such a staple in Aztec society. Um, and so then also there's this picture at the bottom. So it is depicting a commoner woman selling chilies in the local market. So a lot of the time commoner women would do this in order to supplement the income that their husbands were bringing in. Um, and Bernal Diaz, a Spanish conquistador actually remarked on this in a primary source account. He said how really shocked he was to see women selling goods in the market because obviously that was something that Spanish women could not do in their society. Um, and so in contrast with the Aztecs, when the Spanish started to have relationships with indigenous women, a multiracial society ensued. So the Spanish created a race-based legal caste system in which the inhabitants of colonial Mexico were ranked according to their skin color. So at the top of this, we have the Peninsulars who were Spaniards born in Spain. Beneath them were the Creoles born in New Spain as Spanish parents. Mestizos, born of Spanish and Native American parents, mulattoes, born of Spanish and African parents, and then at the bottom were Africans and Indians. Um, and so then also the use of Catholic convents in regards to social status. So a lot of times dowries were very expensive for families. So if families couldn't afford them, they would just send their daughter to a convent in order to prevent their daughter marrying a man that wasn't in their social status because they wanted to keep like the blood pure. So they would just send them into a convent in order to uh, make sure that that didn't happen. Um, and so then also um, in my research, religion is another key element that influenced the worth of women in each society. Um, but uh, the Aztec indigenous religion actually created a society that had a more positive outlook on women in their role, while the Catholic Church and the patriarchy was really the driving force for oppression in uh, for women in Aztec society. So, or women in colonial Mexican society, sorry. Um, so to begin with the Aztecs, you have Aztec creation stories. So through these stories, it was really understood that the birth of all living things required a male and female contribution. Um, and that really uh, helped to emphasize the equivalence of men and women in the home. So really, they understood that in order for this uh, family to succeed, they needed uh, contributions from each. So then you also have gods and goddesses. So not only do you have gods such as um, hunting, war, and rain, but then you also have goddesses that were dedicated to sexuality and fertility. And so then women as priests, so in some cases, um, mothers would take their newborn daughters to dedicate um, their life to a, a temple service when they were older. And so Aztec women were really allowed to have um, an important and a leadership role in their indigenous religion. So then moving along to religion in colonial Mexico. So one of my sources um, by Charles Gibson, Spain and America, he really wrote something that stood out to me. So he remarked that um, this, uh, the same nation that was exploiting the indigenous peoples was the same Spain that occupied itself with converting the indigenous peoples to Christianity. So this paradox that he remarks uh, really um, is the, gives rise to the belief that the only true Spanish objective in the new world was exploitation and that Christianity was only a justification for their actions. So in colonial Mexico, the Catholic Church entrusted husbands with the physical and spiritual well-being of their family members. So men had the right to physically punish women and women had to obey what men said. And then also the role of convents. So convents off, uh, offered women a surrogate family and an alternative lifestyle while also relieving the burden of sustaining uh, surplus elite women. And also having a daughter in a convent was a strategy that a lot of elite families used to say, hey, not only are we extremely uh, wealthy, but we're also deeply religious. So then finally, my conclusions, um, it is uh, evident that the Aztecs and Spanish had vastly different societies. It was uh, very clear that they had different beliefs on what it was to be a woman and what it was to be a man. 
Spanish women were judged and treated based off of their race and class, and their status was further hindered by the Catholic Church and their ideals, such as the patriarchy. So obviously, um, Peninsular women were regarded more highly than Mestizo or African women in colonial Mexican society, but with the ideology of the Catholic Church, Peninsular women were still subordinate to their husbands and were still expected to obey their wishes. And then finally, Aztec women were seen as equal to their husbands in terms of household and duties. Um, so this really obviously stems again from those Aztec creation stories and gender parallelism. And so finally, overall, while Aztec women did have more independence than women in colonial Mexico, Aztec women still did not enjoy complete and utter freedom. They still had certain standards that they had to abide by and were still representative of their husband. So then this is my bibliography. And then that's it. Okay, everyone, questions for Serena. Serena, this is Dr. Nelson. I'll, I'll be the first one. Okay. Um, really interesting, and I applaud you. Um, it's hard Thank enough you. to do this, let alone to do it virtually. <laughs> yeah. um, I think you set a high bar there. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was, uh, I was encouraged to hear you talk about how uh, the Reconquista kind of fueled this conquest and we see the persistence of, of Spanish culture um, as the Spanish create this empire and invade and take over this Aztec world. What, just to, if you could take it a step beyond, I was wondering what, what elements of the Aztec culture persisted? In, in other words, are there are there larger themes or are there larger examples that you might identify that, you know, obviously looking beyond just the role of women, but how uh, perhaps Spanish culture was was transformed by this uh, clash of cultures? So are you asking basically how the Spanish was influenced by the Aztecs? Well, yeah. And that's yeah. Yeah, in essence. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, really, because when the Spanish came in and conquered the Aztecs, even though they conquered them, the Aztecs, their religion and their society kind of still uh, was sustained. Um, so they really could still, in these certain areas, go about their daily lives in the ways that they were used to. It was really only in these like urban centers that they kind of took over. So the wow. Aztecs, while they were defeated, their um, their culture still lived on. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Serena? Serena, you mentioned um, like when they would go into urban centers, they would kind of have to play the part of Spanish society just then. So how did women like deal with that? What kind of steps? I'm not sure it may be outside of the scope of what you looked at, but what like, steps did they have to take to kind of fit that Spanish mold coming from their indigenous community? Yeah, that's a good question. I really didn't look into that a whole lot, um, but I really didn't see um, the, the reason that my research really looked at more of like Spanish women coming over from Spain and kind of how that transformed. I'm not really sure if the Aztecs would have Dr. Summer can tell you, I'm not really sure if Aztecs really spent a lot of time in those urban centers with the Spanish together. I don't think that that really would have been something that they would have done. That makes sense. Well, I think what Serena has done really well in, especially in her paper, but also in this presentation, was to highlight the class divisions between, you know, not only between and among men and women, but between and among these different levels of society among the Aztecs because I think a lot of times when we look back on this, we look at it as like the Spanish versus the indigenous peoples. But of course that really makes the indigenous peoples and especially the Aztecs, which were this really highly hierarchical stratified society to be quite monolithic, right? And homogenous, which of course they weren't, they were a very advanced civilization. So Serena, I wanna applaud you because I think one of the things that you do very, very well in this paper is to highlight the importance of social class and so the difference between class, 
not only for the Spanish, which I think is more obvious to Western audiences, but also among the Aztecs. And that's something that you do very well in your argument and you highlight it here in your presentation as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, more questions for Serena, everybody. Serena, if I if I may, um, mm -hmm. as you um, have worked with this, um, one of the things that it seems to me that you've emphasized is that um, the ability, you know, of a family, for instance, to put a uh, let's call it an extra girl <laughs> um, <laughs> into, into a, a convent, a nunnery, um, these sorts of things whereby they could um, move that responsibility from, from the family to a religious institution. That seems to be something that would have been um, unique a unique opportunity for the upper class families right. and not for lower class families. And it, yes, seems, sure. it seems also that a lower class family <laughs> would have by necessity been more complementarian than patriarchal in the sense that you've described and used these terms. Is that the case? Uh, it seems that lower class families are going to need each other contributing in mm -hmm. ways that upper class families <clears throat> may not need each other contributing to make it all work. Yeah, most definitely. So obviously elite families, these peninsular families um, who would put their daughters in convents, they obviously didn't need their help, whereas people from the lower class probably did. So um, in convents, it was obviously, like you said, more elite women could only go to that. I think that they did allow some lower class women, but they obviously were not as the in that high rank. I think there were two different types of nuns in convents. And so those uh, like lower status women would take on those lesser roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would a lower class Spanish family's experience have mirrored more closely the Aztec family experience when it comes to these relationships and duties and functions within the family and that sort of thing? Probably. That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say <laughs> so probably, um, but again, obviously the Spanish did have the patriarchy against them. Um, so that was obviously still prevalent in uh, lower class families in Spanish society. That was different than Aztec families. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And this was beyond the scope of Serena's research, but something that historians are now studying. I mean, this is kind of a real hot topic right now in historiography of colonial Latin America is like, what kind of changes do does colonial Latin American society experience as mestizaje becomes the preeminent social structure um, all throughout colonial Latin America. So, you know, after the conquest, after the invasion of the Spanish, and then when you begin to see numbers of indigenous peoples, the demog demographics actually on the rise again, you know, especially like in the 18th century, then you really begin to see, okay, what specific aspects of indigenous culture have survived. And it is oftentimes the case that in these, you know, more urban, or more more rural places, right, where you see a lot of indigenous practices continuing. So like today, and Highland's going to tell you about this more today, right, among the Mayan communities, you see a lot of the indigenous practices actually continuing even today, like in the 21st century, because of their rural location, right, and, and because they were not as desirable initially by the Spanish. So that's, you know, it's really interesting to see the connections between these different um, presentations and these different research projects. Okay, other questions for Serena, everybody? Questions, questions, questions. Maybe lose Tizer. I just accidentally clicked the hang up button. Rather than <laughs> it's not going to be last time that happens. Don't take it personally, Serena. It was a, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Serena. That was wonderful. Thank Yay. you.
Bravo. By the way, Bravo. Nelson, it's quite hilarious to see. It's like a young Dr. Nelson sitting in the middle of our screen as you're talking. Like, it's, it's really funny. All right, Zach, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Let's do it. Woohoo! All right, y'all tell me if y'all can see it. Good? No? Nope, can't see you. How about now? Zach Davis is presenting. Okay, hold on one second. Yep, it's small, but we can see it. Is everyone, can everyone see Zach's presentation? Okay. All right, take it away, Zach. All right, so I did mine on gender expectations and how women challenge the general norm in colonial Latin America. And I would first like to start off with some background. So why I chose this topic, um, I would say it wasn't necessarily in the prereq. I mean, really, the only thing that kind of triggered me was Catalina, who I'll touch on, and Sorwana, but it was the race and gender class that I took with Dr. Sumner that really got me on this topic um, because it really put in a more broad like look for me because I just wanted to see like even how today it was as different for women like with wage gaps and stuff between men and women. Um, some major areas where women struggled, honoring of the spouse, court system, and education, which I'll touch on later. Um, and the way I set up this presentation was I'm going to present the thesis, my research questions, historical background, the expectations for men and women, uh, women who set out to challenge the norm, the court system, the role of education, my impactful sources, and some conclusions that I've made. Okay, so my thesis, the expectations between men and women were viewed as being much more different in the fact that men were educated, held high positions in society, and were basically due to free to do whatever they pleased with little to no consequences. While women were only educated if they were in convents, which their fathers placed them in, or they were regular women who got viewed as prostitutes in many cases. I argue that if women would have been equally treated in court systems, political decisions, and had the right to obtain an education, the male domination would have been less prominent. So some questions, the major research questions that I developed were, how did education play a major role in the separation of the two genders? And what were the struggles of being uneducated? Um, how were women treated in the court system? And how did the church tie into this? And what were the advantages that men had access to that placed them above women in every aspect of life? All right, so some historical background, the importance of marriage and how it established a head start for male domination. So when I say this, I mean that it was important for men to keep their heirs so they were very focused on if they were wealthy, keeping their family wealthy. So in many cases, a man would have, you know, several different wives just to keep his heirs. So he would try to have as many sons as he could. Um, the major impact of education and how it never allowed women to fight for themselves. So education was a huge part of this research and how women, even such as Donna and Nasha, who stated here, from Katana says no. Um, she came from a very, very wealthy family, and in her will, she was that she was left with. She couldn't read or write, even though she was wealthy, so she was uneducated. So she had to have another family member who was male write her will. And in this will, she left things such as land and stuff like that to her head slaves and. Later in the book, it describes how her uncle um, went against her will because it was too detailed and basically went against what she wanted just because she was uneducated and couldn't fight for what she like placed in her will. Uh, the establishment of convents and how it seemed great for women but was just still in favor for men. I say this because... Even though that these women were in convents, you know, and they were able to be educated and things like that, they still, I mean, in many cases, women did want to be in a convent, but in, as younger women, like teenagers, the father would place them in these convents. So still they, in a more broad aspect, still they didn't have a say-so 
at a younger age of what they wanted. It was still male dominated by their fathers and what they wanted. So moving on, I felt this was important just to kind of show the difference between the roles of men and women. So some traditional roles for men. Um, Latin America was and is slash was considered a patriarchal society, meaning it was male dominated. Men had all the power socially and economically. Um, they were the main supporter of the family. They had a formal education, full participation in government, depending on social class. So the roles for men were basically they were free to do whatever they controlled every aspect of life. So they ran the government. They made political decisions, um, which, again, like I said here, they had most had formal education, which allowed them to do many more things that women could not. Um, so moving on to the traditional roles for women, um, stay at home, provided a family, um, cleaning, cooking, um, usually un uh, uneducated unless they're in convents, expected to honor their husband and be able to have children. Like I said earlier, it was important for men. Again, this is in favor for men. It was important for them, for women to be able to have children and a lot of children because they wanted to keep their family, if they were wealthy, they wanted to keep their family wealthy, and it was mainly all about heirs. So moving on, I chose these three women because they were the most impactful to my research. So the first is Catalina de Rosa. She has stated that she's in the first picture right there to the left. She was a transvestite woman who escaped her convent and disguised herself as a man. And she was educated, and she was... When she disguised herself as a, as a man, she traveled the world. She committed crimes. She, I mean, she stole, she killed people. And her story was very impactful to my research because it proved that women were capable of going out and doing those things if they were just given the opportunity to, which they never were. Um, the second woman is Madre, uh, Madre Maria Rosa. Um, she is very impactful because she is from the book, uh, the five Capuchin nuns and her story is very impactful to my research because she documented every day of their travel. Um, they set out to the new world to set up monasteries and they battled, I mean, they battled pirates on in the ocean. They battled everything. They, it was very important too, because the, Spanish War Secession was going on during their travels, and they were able to avoid these things, avoid the war, never be killed. And it proved that women were intelligent enough to do these things, which is another part of what my research is about. Because in many of my sources, it says that men believe that they were women just were incapable of doing these things and obtaining an education. Uh, and the last woman was Sor Juana de la Cruz, which Serena talked about and she was very important because she was in a convent but she was very very educated and she used um, poems and plays to you know contradict and go against what men had to say against women so moving on to how the court system was male dominated um, women were subject to abuse and the church supported the men, saying that it was their right to punish their wives. Um, this was in many of my sources. I mean, women would be abused by their husbands. And they, even when they went to court, the priest would say it, they have the right to um, abuse them in little cases. But obviously men took this way too far and the church supported it, which I found to be very, very crazy. Um, many women stopped trying to defend themselves because they knew they would never win. So women, like I said, they would be abused and they would get cheated on and they still knew that they could never win. So they just stopped trying. Um, so how education placed women at a disadvantage. I found this quote, um, very helpful from Susan Scullo. It says intellectually inferior of possessing only limited understanding, women were constitutionally incapable of treating matters of substance. Furthermore, their lack of mental acuity made it unnecessary to teach them to write. Um, this 
really stuck out to me because it's crazy that like men believed that they were incapable of even obtaining an education. So they just never did, which I found also to be weird because they were placed in convents and they were educated in those. So why men believe that they were incapable of doing it was just, it was almost like a brainwash to women and making them believe that they were not able to obtain an education. And then some of my primary sources, like I said earlier, um, this one is by Rosa Marie and Sarah E. Owens. Well, translated by Sarah E. Owens, the journey of five Capuchin nuns. Um, this one, this source provided and proved that education allowed women to travel the world. Like these women, they, they set out these five nuns, they set out across the, across the, to travel to the new world in order to set up new monasteries. And this source was really impactful to my research because like Serena said, it was hard to find primary sources from women because they, many couldn't read or write. And Madri proved that by documenting every day of their journey, that, that women were uh, capable of doing these crazy things that only men were provided with. Um, it also proved that women could endure just as much as men. Like I said earlier, I mean that by saying that they avoided being killed. They avoided pirates and things like that. So they were meant also mentally tough, but also physically tough. And this book really proved that. Um, so primary sources continue. Um, another primary source, Lieutenant Nunn, which was Catalina de Rosa. Um, her story was very, very helpful because she proved that men looked over the fact of just, you know, women and how they were looked at. But she also proved that she could get away with things because she was a virgin. So when she returned back to her convent after, you know, her 20 year journey, she was still seen as a pure woman, which was very, very uh, big status in colonial Latin America. And then other helpful sources was Katana says, no, uh, she was, this one was about the Donna and issue. And like I said earlier about, her will and how she was came from a wealthy family, but still, still got screwed over in the end by her own family member. Um, and then Sorwana on men's hypocrisy. This was a poem Serena touched on. Um, this, this poem really was impactful because uh, Sorwana talked about, you know, how a man was never happy. They always whined about everything and how, a woman can never do anything right, which I found to be very impactful to my research. And then Stephen Stern, Steve Stern, The Secret History of Gender. Um, a few things that his book stood out to me about was he like broke it up into many things. So in the first part, he talks about a couple, Jose Marcelino and Mar Maria Tessa, and how Jose was a drunk. They were a poor family. But he expected her to, you know, have meals cooked for her for him every day when he returned from work. And if she didn't, I mean, he, in his book, he talked about how she would how he would come home and just destroy the house and things like that. And she even tried to, you know, get a divorce with him and still the court system and priests and all never allowed that. Um, he also talked about um, the church and how priests would confuse the un unpure women by molesting and raping them, saying that it was their in their interest of salvation. And since they live in a society where the obedience of women was law, it was very difficult for women to defend themselves. So was, this part was kind of an eye opener for me because like the church would confuse these women. I mean, many uneducated, so they didn't know any better. And, and so they basically raped and molested him, saying that it was for the church. And I found that to be very, I mean, it was just wild to read. Um, and then what I learned, I learned that many of the ways that men 
and women perceive each other today was established during colonial times. This was kind of the backbone of why, what piqued my interest in this topic, because just, you know, like I said earlier, the wage gap still today between men and women and just how they view each other. You know, men still kind of believe that, you know, women are less than what they are. And that's what really piqued my interest in this topic. I learned that throughout my research that every system in colonial Latin America was set up in favor for men, even within convents. So, I mean, politically in every aspect, every aspect of life, I mean, it was in favor for men. I mean, every decision that the church made was in favor for men, like the abuse. I mean, they said that they had the right to abuse their, their spouse and things like that. And then I also learned that this is why women never lose an argument today. Ha ha ha. Um, in conclusion, the manipu- the manipulation that men put on women in Latin America ultimately placed them at a major disadvantage in every aspect of life. Women never received a fair trial in court, never played a major role in political decisions, and never got a chance to prove their intelligence. Though there were women who went out against the norm and proved women could obtain the same rights as men, the majority suffered from patriarchy and lived their lives under male domination without any say-so in their own life. And then my whole bibliography right here, but I had to, my computer wouldn't fit at all, so it's all on there. I just have to scroll down. And so, how do I get it? And that is it. Questions? Yay! Yay, Zach! Woohoo! Can y'all see All right, everybody. I can't see Hold y'all. on. No, I can only, no. we can see a Z. Let me see if I can just go back. Or Zach. We need to see Zach without a hat. It did It did this the other day when we did it. It wouldn't pull back up my thing. Let's see if I can. I had camera trouble this morning, too. Let me see if I can just exit out and then get back in. Okay. Bye, Zach. Bye, Zach. Good presentation. Peace yeah, out. No See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. Can you see me now? No. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or, nope. yeah. Yes. Okay, questions for Zach, everybody. In that very uncontroversial presentation. I really liked your joke. <laughs> I put that in there for the practice one, and I was meaning to take it out. But I I'm glad you kept it. I might want to read it. Nah. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. Know your audience. Know your audience. Yeah. Okay, questions for Zach. Zach, if I could lead out with a question for you. Um, yes, sir. You uh, you have um, studied. Um, some unusual characters in the history of uh, colonial Latin America. And you kind of worked out of the context of a a micro history in a Mm -hmm. sense with these individuals. Um, What gives you the, um, just as a, uh, you made a decision to use those um, unique circumstances and situations Mm -hmm. to build some conclusions. Um, explain to me kind of that process of how you take a person who um, uh, is very unique, these three people that you've you've identified, very unique people. Uh, And then how do you, how do you then feel confident to build conclusions that would then apply to a broader um, audience or a broader, uh, larger group of people? Well, when I talked about, you know, Catalina and then Sorwana, I mean, it was hard not to use them because their stories just presented so many more things than like, um, I don't know how I'm trying to say this. They like, especially Catalina, like she presented just much more than going out and proving that women could, you know, do these things as like men could, but she proved that like education played a factor. Um, just disguising herself proved and, and how she never got caught also proved to me that men overlook many things like looks. I mean, they, I mean, she never got caught as being a woman and just, I mean, it proved that maybe men were incapable of, you know, 
seeing, you know what I'm saying? Just seeing these simple things. <laughs> and then, you know, Sorwana just, I mean, it was very, it's very easy to build, like you said, to build like conclusions off of just even this, like these two women, because they prove just so much that education played a factor. You know, if women were educated, how, you know, this then societies would have been totally different. And, you know, women probably would have been, you know, able to divorce their abusing husbands and stuff if they could have just defended themselves. You know, mm-hmm. education was a very impactful part. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the, uh, let me try to thank you for that answer. You got out of, I, I, I want to clarify my question just a little bit further. And that is, um, are, are these women actually representative of women in the general population of colonial oh. Latin America? In other words, I know that not everybody's in a convent. I know that, but their thinking is their thinking typical of women in colonial Latin America. These specific women that I'm talking about, I don't believe so because, like I said in the presentation, I believe that you know uneducated women were almost brainwashed in a sense by men. You know, just Hmm. because I think they believe that they were incapable because that's all that they were taught. You know, that men men basically brainwashed them in believing that they were incapable of obtaining these, you know, high hold, holding positions and obtaining an education. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Yes, sir. I just wanted to add to, and that's a, a really good question and something that Zach and I talked about while he was doing this presentation is, so what do we do with these exceptional cases? Right. And, and, um, Sor Juana, especially, right. I mean, she is just, she's exceptional in so many different ways. She's an incredible person, but the way that she dies, right, yeah. and uh, is just is so very, horrible because very young. very young, and she basically is demanded to suppress all of her, you know, intellectual thoughts, all of her worldly items that she possesses, yeah. and actually her experience, if you look at the long durée of her life, is representative, yeah. um, in the way that you know, male-dominated institutions were able to suppress women's intellectual freedom. But I, but Dr. Heiser, that's a really good question. And I think it's something that we really have to think about because um, it's really important, especially for a lot of these students. And we talked about this a lot. A lot of these students who study gender in the colonial era, I think it's easy to apply modern day notions of, you know, equality to the past, but we have to be really careful not to do that. Right. Because this is the 21st century. Things are very different. We live in the Western world. And these were very different places in different times. So, Zach, you're you know you're saying about the idea of brainwashing, but you know maybe it's also just that things worked differently, yeah. right? And so yeah. we have to be a little bit careful about taking these modern day ideas and applying them to the past. Yeah. yeah. Of course, Dr. Sumner, at another time, you're going to have to tell me how Sarwana died because I don't know this, <laughs> but it, uh, this is not the point of this particular moment, but uh, now you've piqued my interest, okay? But I'm done for now. Thank you. Yeah. The one, when in doubt, the answer is disease, and that is the yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Zach, I have a question real quickly. I, yes, I'm, I'm intrigued by... When you look at Soruana, Catalina, and Maria Rosa, that all of them are tied. Obviously, you tie it to education, but there's also that other uh, common element of the church. It, yep. is, is there? I'm just wondering: is there anything that they're finding within <clears throat> theology that is liberating them or encouraging them to to kind of break the the? You know, we often might think of religion as perhaps limiting their roles or are they seeing it as something that's that's liberating well they're they're all kind of different because um Sorwana, you know she's she stayed in her convent um but with like uh, <coughs> she actually like got mad within her convent at other women which kind of forced her to you know want to leave but um Yes, they're they're all kind of very different stories, um, but they all, like you said, they all kind of tie together with the education factor and everything. But you know, Sorwana, she stayed within the convent and basically proved herself 
within the convent while, you know, Catalina proved herself by going out of the convent and using what she, you know, her skills that she obtained within the convent in the real world. Um, yeah, Catalina, she got mad and at the other women and that's why she left. Um, so yeah, they're all kind of different, but same, the same in many, in many, many ways. Okay. Other questions for Zach, guys. Zach, I have a quick question for you. So in the beginning of your presentation, you, you and we've talked about this, you wrote that um, men had no consequences for their actions, mm -hmm. right? That they were like, and as compared to women, mm -hmm. of course, they had much fewer consequences. But do you, do you think that that's true? That men, regardless of their class standing, regardless of who they are, their background had no consequences for their well, actions I mean, they had consequences and but i mean yes class played a very impactful role but okay even with like stephen stern like he stated with like i said about jose and his wife i mean they were a very poor family and mm -hmm. even when she tried to divorce him i mean she still never could like the yeah. church is still so it was like yes i'm sure that like the lower class you know they were obviously would probably suffer more consequences men but like i mean even still i'd like it like with with that case like even that stuck out to me like you know like i would think too you know higher class people you know they get away with more during this time men and lower class would still get punished the same which in many cases they didn't so it was pretty cool that's that struck that stuck stuck out to me too like even how these poor families and men still got away with many things. I mean, yes, they were consequences in many uh -huh. things, but in many cases, such as abuse and all, which yeah. is a lot of my sources, then still got away with it no yeah. matter the class. No, and I think what you did in over the course of your research and trying to figure out, because you were inspired by reading so many of these sources from class, and then your ability to go through and kind of pick out these two main institutions, the court system and education as being these really important dividing factors between men and women was really great. So I applaud yeah. you for that. Nice job, Zach. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, other questions for Zach? Zach, I have a question. So our our topics were like very similar. So I guess in your opinion and through your research, like do you think it was more Spanish society itself or like the institution of Catholicism more to blame for the treatment of women? Well, I would say that like, like with yours, you know, like the Spanish coming in, that change many things you know what i'm saying so like for the aztecs and the women that changed so much so i i mean it would i would almost lean towards you know the spanish coming in and you know just the way they change pretty much every aspect of how in a culture pretty much i mean it was i would say more of that you know i mean in my opinion so mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. But to be Spanish was to be Catholic. I mean, yeah. those things are yeah. inseparable. Yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. I think they both played, you know, a very impactful role. They had, I mean, like with the church, I mean, the church was so impactful. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, they, like with these abuse cases, I mean, they made the decisions on what happened. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what's interesting too is that, you know, when. The Spanish come over to Mexico. They're like, eh, the Inquisition's going okay, you know, uh, in Peninsular Spain. But we're going to make Mexico this even more, you know, Catholic oriented place. And so, in many ways, actually, what we what historians are finding is that in the Americas is where you see the kind of more even more extreme examples of the way that things like the Inquisition was played out, even as compared to mainland Spain. Yeah. Okay. Other any other concluding questions for Zach? All right, let's take a like a quick five minute break, shall we? Get a glass of water, water. bathroom, etc. Okay.
Hey, Ellie. <laughs> oh my. You ready to get this over with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm also kind of nervous. Yeah. I wish I could have gone first and just got it done yeah. with. But. but then again, it's like you go first, and then now you have to listen to every, you know what I mean? Everything. Yeah. Uh, you did a phenomenal job. Oh, thank you. I'm certainly as nervous as like blue Kali. <laughs> My guy. What type of flowers are those? Fake ones. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't even want to do this. I know, but I would so much rather do it on here than in front of everybody and Neville. Yeah, that's true, I guess. Because all my dipshit friends would be there and they'd be like, like you know. <laughs> I'd be like, okay. <laughs> all right. That was just a lot. Yeah. Wait, so do we have we have a break from 10.30 to 12.30? E-Rod, what up, Slime? <laughs> What's up, Slime? There's a break because we have a faculty meeting. Oh, okay, okay. So we get to go to Zoom and deal with faculty business for an hour and a half. Lucky, lucky. Well, it's going to suck. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound too fun. No. Mm. I like the map behind you there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it goes all over the place. It goes all the way from all the way down here. It's like almost all the way up to like Georgetown. Thomas, oh, Thomas where's your house at on that map? <laughs> Right there. I was joking. <laughs> oh, cat out. It's marked. Because <laughs> when people come in here, they're always like, oh, so where's y'all's house at on the map? And so dad just took a little sharpie and put a dot on it. So he can just be like, here. Right here. <laughs> yeah, he's like, look. Thomas, you been catching any fish out on the flats? No. Actually, yesterday I was leaving. Yesterday I had to, I took some mahi um, to one of our family friends, and uh, when I was leaving the causeway, there was some tailing on the flat. I called Larry, Lair Boy. I was like, Lair Boy, dude, they're hammering out there in the grass right now. And he's like, okay, okay, I'm on the way. And he went out there and caught a stud. Look, hold on. I was mad, dude. That was nice. That's what I'm saying. On the fly, too. I was like, good stuff, Lair Boy. That looks amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was fun. All right, everybody, you ready? We're going to continue now with the one and only Kendall McGeorge. Kendall. Hello. Let's see if I can figure this out. Whose family has ditched her? Yeah, my family is not here. They are working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Go away Which too. I respect. Can Only you see mom. it? Mm -hmm. Only my mom. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm going good. So this is the Battle of the Nuns, how nuns feed the patriarchy in New Spain. Um, this is my outline. This is kind of what I'm going to go through. Um, so to start, the four main themes of this study and my historical background. So the first one is the patriarchy, which is known as the domination of men over women. It played an influential role within convents throughout colonial Latin America and specifically in New Spain or modern day Mexico. Um, so in society, gender played the most important role in determining an individual's place. And because of this, men typically participated in the more important sectors of society, so civil offices and making political decisions, which then led to institutionalized patriarchy, for example, the Catholic Church. 
Um, and this prevented the rise of women in society and kept them in subordinating roles. Um, so the Catholic Church throughout New Spain in the 17th and 18th centuries was a central institution in a patriarchal society, and it was able to reinforce gender norms by creating spaces where women could live and have their own independence. And it was one of the most in, most powerful institutions at the time of the Spanish conquest because one of the first goals of the Spanish was to spread Christianity. And then the spread of Christianity in the Americas led to the opening of convents and a shift in gender norms for many indigenous people living there, like um, Serena said. So um, in colonial society, women really only had two choices in how to live their lives. So first, women were primarily in charge of the home if they were part of an elite family, and otherwise they played supportive roles in the public sector. So buying, selling, or manufacturing goods as a way to assist their families in bringing in income. Um, but many women decided to become nuns because it offered a way of life where they could develop talents and become leaders in their communities. But instead, like a lot of the time they had to submit to men within the church hierarchy. But regardless of that, professing as a nun was probably the best option for women if they decided that marriage wasn't for them. Because by living in convents, they were able to gain access to opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. However, life within the walls of convents was not all that different from life in regular society because by professing as a nun, women were still able to gain access and achieve the expectation of marriage. But instead of to a physical man, it was to God. And simultaneously, they were able to play an important role in society. So convents were created by powerful men and women to offer women refuge from the constraints of patriarchal society as a way, as well as maintain their purity or their virginity. Um, and in these convents, women were able to pursue a religious life while also maintaining their independence. And nuns were often treated as if they were dead to the world, meaning that they were supposed to be devoted to God and to the church rather than have contact to the outside world and see their families or friends. And the patriarchal norms of society because of this were able to encroach on women within the walls of convents throughout New Spain and in a way actually brought the pressures of the world into convent life. So my initial observations and why I wanted to research this topic for my capstone um, comes from the poem by Sor Juana on men's hypocrisy, which which describes the double standards that were present in New Spain when it came to the relationship between men and women, because women were supposed to play subordinate roles in society and never question the authority of men. But when women did question men, they were punished for taking action and told that they were at fault for everything. And I thought that this poem was super interesting because Sir Juana was writing this poem questioning men, and it was a poem about how women shouldn't question men. So I wanted to look more into that and see like if she was representative of other women in society or if she was kind of like a loner in this. So that led to my research question, which is what role did convents play in colonial society? Did they reinforce gender norms or allow women to play an active role in society? And how did different nuns react to the gender norms that were present in their life? And then my thesis is the Catholic Church was an impressive institution that was used as a tool by the patriarchy, the domination of men over women during the 17th and 18th centuries. Because women had few options in society, women could get married, profess as a nun, or become a prostitute. The Catholic Church had the opportunity to expand the role of marriage in society to include marriage to God. In some cases, convents offered a place of refuge for women. However, in many cases, the Catholic Church was able to reinforce patriarchal norms within society by opening convents throughout New Spain. So then my historiography, um, there's four women that I'm gonna look at. They're all historians. So the first one is Josefina Muriel. She wrote The Role of Convents in Colonial Society. And she wrote that in 1979. She was one of the first um, historians to write about the importance of nuns in colonial society. And in her journal article, um, she discusses the practical life that convents provided for women in society. 
how they provided a lifetime of protection for women and how convents were a place for men to send the women to be to let them be devoted to God and remain protected from the temptations of society. And I found that this historical narrative was primarily focused on the important role that convents played in society and how they provided a safe space for women to live and grow in their relationship with God. And then I went on to read Catherine Burns, who wrote Colonial Habits, Convents, and the Spiritual Economy of Cusco, Peru, which isn't New Spain, but I thought it was important to um, look at and talk about because it focuses on the importance of convents in colonial society and now how nuns played a large role in economic growth throughout Peru because nuns did hold a lot of the money and the funds in society. So they were able to support and help grow the economy. Um, and Burns talks about how nuns were at the center of life in colonial society. And the source provides examples of how important nuns were in a patriarchal society, yet how the men in society would not allow women to be free thinkers and kept them in these supportive roles because they would soon become a burden on the men. Um, and then Margaret Chowning, who wrote Rebellious Nuns, The Troubled History of a Mexican Convent from 1752 to 1863. This one was probably one of my favorites because she discusses how many believe that nuns are passive and unlikely to become rebellious, but how nuns are actually very rebellious and how they create turmoil. Um, the book describes the willingness of nuns to fight for what they believed in, even though they were seen as being lower in society and how they were supposed to submit to the will of men. So in this book, she describes two different groups of nuns in the same convent. So one group really followed their vows exactly. They never questioned the church hierarchy. And then this other group of nuns, um, they questioned everything. They didn't understand, like in this convent, they were, they weren't allowed to have like slaves or serve each other. They were supposed to do everything themselves. And these women didn't understand why they were supposed to be like that when they, their one job was to be devoted to God and their marriage to God. And then they started to like fight against each other. And it led to the closing of the convent in 1863. And by reading this source, I came to understand the different views of the patriarchy in New Spain and how they have um, evolved because this source does show the many times that women didn't fall to the pressures of society and the pressures of the patriarchy. And then the combination of Chowning and Burns works provided a context that showed the importance of nuns within society and their rebellious tendencies. Um, and by looking at these sources, I came to understand the deception that was created within convents and the role of the patriarchy um, within the walls of convents. And then the last one is Asuncion Levrin. She wrote Brides of Christ, Conventional Life in Colonial Mexico, and she wrote that in 2008. She describes the traditional life of a nun beginning with their decision to enter the convent and all the way up until their death. And throughout the book, she addresses the creation of convents and how patriarchal norms of society played a role in everyday life, even within the walls of convents. And then she also indicates the different relationships that were formed between nuns, families, and men that were involved in the church hierarchy and how they played a role in the everyday lives of nuns. And then the book also describes the important role of gender in convents and how it affected the women um, and then by understanding the lives of convents, I came to understand how different nuns perceived the role of men within society in New Spain and how men affected the lives of women within the convents. So then some common themes. The first one I found was involvement and importance of nuns in society. Um, because nuns did play a vital role in the success of each community and convent through their regulation of the economy and how they were at the center of society. I found that was a theme throughout each book. Um, and then women's roles in society changed based on family status. So there was a social hierarchy that was created between the nuns um, in each convent that was based on race and social class. So elites who came from well-off families, they were typically of the black veil um, and they were considered to be the well-educated women. They had sizable dowries. They could vote into the convent and they could serve in offices. 
And then the women of the who are of the white veil, they didn't have the same opportunities as the nuns of the black veil because of their race. And these women typically worked as housekeepers and worked other jobs that were seen as not suitable for nuns of the black veil. And then the final um, status was the women who were poor and of mixed race. They served the nuns of the white veil. And by having these social hierarchies, um, the convent lifestyle seemed to have mirrored the norms of society that was present outside of convent walls. And then finally, nuns had a rebellious nature. So they rebelled in different ways, depending on why they entered the convent and then the treatment that they were receiving, which I'm, I'll go into on the next slide. Um, so the first nun that I really looked into was Sir Juana and Ace de la Cruz. She was a Hieronymite nun in Mexico during the 17th century. And like Zach and Serena talked about, she was very influential in everything that she did. Um, so she entered her Hieronymite convent, which was her second convent. And that's where she lived and learned and wrote for the rest of her life. And the reason why she left her first one was because it was too oppressive for her. And she wanted to have the freedom to um, work on her education. And so she was an intellectual. She described her thirst for knowledge being stronger than the desire to eat, which led to when she was a child, a want to go to university. But at the time, women weren't allowed to attend university. So she asked her mother if she could dress as a man, um, which her mom said, absolutely not. That is not allowed. So she decided to join convents um, because they did offer her the independence to work on her education without having to fall to the pressures of getting married and take care of a family. She never let typical gender norms stop her from reaching her own goals, even though it would have made her life a lot easier. And because her convent gave her so much freedom, she was able to fight for the education of women. She always discussed that the general idea of wisdom would be pleasing to God. So why shouldn't she be allowed to learn and write and teach others. Um, and then she died of the plague. Dr. Heiser, this is to answer your question. Um, she died of the plague because one day there was this sermon that came out and it was very well received, except for Sor Juana wrote a criticism against it and someone published it. And this led to the church and the archbishop taking away all of her books, all of her possessions. She was sent into isolation and then she was supposed to um, tend to the nuns who had fallen ill to the plague, which then meant that she fell ill to the plague and that's how she died. Um, but her work was very influential, except for she's not very representative of all nuns. Um, not very many nuns wanted to fight for the education of women. Um, a lot of nuns did not question the patriarchal norms of society, um, but she was very interesting to learn about. And then Maria de San Jose, she was a nun in Oxica, Mexico, and she was the daughter of Hacienda owners, so plantations. And her family consisted of 11 children with only nine surviving, so one boy and eight girls. And she was troubled as a child, especially after her father's death. But throughout her life, she had been told that she was going to join a convent. Everybody she met told her like that was her destiny. And she didn't want to believe that. Even though she was raised in a well-off family and they were very Catholic, like they followed everything. But one day she was, she had this vision and it was because um, she was hanging out with this group of girls. And one of the girls upset her, which led Maria to curse her. And God didn't like that. So God sent down a bolt of lightning, which hit a wall. And the wall kind of exploded. And then this animal was dead. And if that wasn't enough, when she was walking home afterwards, she ran into this man who was um, the devil in disguise. And so Maria knew that this was a sign telling her that if she didn't change her ways, then she was going to end up in a dark place. And from this experience and this vision, Maria decided to better her life by entering into a convent and devoting her life to God. So Maria spent just as much time outside of a convent as she did within a convent, which gives an interesting perspective on life in colonial society. So 
after she had spent a significant amount of time in her convent, her confessor asked her to write about her life. Um, she didn't want to because she didn't know how to write, but he told her as long as she trusted in God, everything would be okay. Um, but the one thing that has to be thought about is during this time, women women really weren't allowed to publish their own works before a man had looked at it. So their confessor or their priest had to look at it before they could publish. And a lot of time it wasn't published under her own under their own name. And I'm not 100% sure that this happened to Maria, but it's definitely something to think about when reading her works. Um, and then Ursula Suarez, she was a Chilean nun, which also isn't New Spain, but she's a she, I like to think that she's a happy medium between Sor Juana and Maria because she's a nonconformist and she pushed the limits of women's roles often at men's expense like Sor Juana did. But uh, she's a lot like Maria de San Jose because she always wanted to join a convent and she was very successful in her convent once she was able to. Um, so from an early age, she wanted to be a nun but she was seen as a troublemaker within her family and she always like played pranks and spoke out of turn and her family didn't think that she was suitable to be a nun. She was also ill as a child. So her mom took her all over the place to try and get her healed, which is how she met all of these different nuns. And what that's really what inspired her um, to become a nun. But when she was she finally joined the convent despite the lack of support from her family. And when she was in the convent, she had a lack of support in the church hierarchy. Um, she was in charge of the inventory and worked with the best. She assisted her. Um, but then one day she was working to become the best. She was running for the election and the convent was split and the, the bishop blamed her for that. And he decided to punish her like Sir Juana, which was a way for him to break her spirits down and like kind of put her into an isolated area and not let her work and do what she needed to do to survive. Um, and then Sor Maria Magdalena, she was an indigenous noblewoman. She lived in one of three convents in New Spain that allowed indigenous women to profess as nuns during the 18th century. She's one of those rare examples where she was a woman who advocated for her rights as an indigenous woman. Um, around 1740, she wrote a letter to Father Juan de Altamirano asking him to write a letter on behalf of the indigenous women to the King of Spain. And she wanted to have this letter sent because Spanish women were being allowed to enter into convents that were supposed to be exclusive for indigenous women. And she didn't really understand why they could enter into the indigenous convents, but she couldn't enter into the Spanish convents. So she's a rare example of a woman acting with agency and participating in the construction of her own identity. And then my conclusion. So I found that there was a lot of animosity between nuns, especially in the convents where they were kind of butting heads um, because they were kind of put against each other based on their vows and what they were being told to do. And these differing experiences led to differing opinions based on like how they were treated in their convents and why they decided to enter into their convents. And then I also came to understand the functions of convents in a patriarchal society. So like they were very important to the economy and teaching the children and ch like really helping build society. Um, and then my primary sources, my secondary sources, and then questions. Yay, woo! -hoo! All right, questions for Kendall, everyone. Kendall, I, I do have a question in um, uh, I don't take it personally. I it just came to me in yours, but it actually is something that I noticed in in all three of the presentations that we've heard so far, where these convents are playing such a significant role. Um, all three of the pr presentations so far has have spoken to the centrality of the convent to the community. Mm -hmm. Why were they central to the community? What did they do? 
um, what services they, they provide, what uh, you talked about the economic um, role that it plays in, in a community. What exactly are these convents doing? The picture I have of a convent is a building that has high walls and big, big, big gates mm -hmm. to keep everybody who's not supposed to be in out. Um, and so the question that I have is what is it, what roles are these, are these institutions actually performing for the colonial society? Okay. So I don't know if I have the exact answer you're looking for, but from my understanding, mm -hmm. it was a lot of, it was very open. Like people were invited to come in and visit and have, um, they had like church services and things like that. And then they were also very like influential, like I said, in the economy because they held so much of the money that was able to support the economy. Um, so they would help build like the businesses and help with trade and things like that. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly everything that they did, but that's from, that's what I understood from all of my research. So, for instance, when, today when we think of nuns, they're often associated in a schooling context, for instance. Mm -hmm. Did they perform yeah. any of those kinds of services to girls in the community, let's say, for instance, or, or uh, whatever? They taught to a certain point. I don't think they taught everybody. I think it was more the elite children. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not exactly sure. That okay. didn't come up a lot in my research. Yeah. Um, well, thank but, you. Appreciate it, Kendall. Yeah. Yeah. But Kendall's point about economics is like essential. So it's very, and especially I think for people who have not studied convents um, outside of Latin America, um, the, Catherine Burns's work and and Kendall and mm -hmm. I have have talked about her work together. She actually discovers that convent, like the convent, was the primary lending institution of most of colonial Peru. So if you wanted, if you were someone who was like, you know, a conquistador or someone who's coming over to try and make a new life in the Americas, the first place that you go is the convent. Okay. So they wield a tremendous amount of authority actually in a place like Cusco in the early colonial period, which is really interesting. And it's great for historians because, you know, they document everything. Right. Well, well, the other thing that kind of associated with that is I, I'm, in t I'm, I'm visualizing this in my mind. Now, her research seems to take her into the 18th century, which is quite far into the yeah. colonial period. But it still seems to me in my mind that I think of the colony as the frontier. Mm -hmm. And so you have this institution on the frontier. What are they doing to develop that frontier is kind of what I was what I was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thank you. The loaning of money is an interesting uh, um, thing. Thank you. Kendall, I have a question for you. Um, yes. You, you talk, so again, <laughs> it's kind of the same thing I raised with Zach. And I'm, I know liberation theology, I'm guessing you did not get into that in colonial Latin America. But, no. but I'm wondering if there are kind of, you know, little roots of that taking place. Is it not just the convent as a as a gathering place, an arena for women to um, get together and gain a sense of agency to a degree? But is there anything, do any of these sources reference any sort of different interpretations from scripture that they're reading into it that it's actually empowering and liberating. Um, do they have that sort of agency within the convent? I'm not sure with all of the nuns. I know with Sir Juana, she used um, scripture as a way to like back up her fight for educational rights. Huh. So she didn't understand why women weren't allowed to gain an education because why wouldn't God want them to read the Bible and understand what he's trying to share and telling them to do in these convents, but they're just supposed to follow what they're being told. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you. Other questions for Kendall? I mean, I think it is an important thing to remember that upon entry in the monastery or a convent, the first thing you did was promise obedience to anybody in authority mm -hmm. over you. Exactly. And so yeah. you're subordinating yourself voluntarily right out of the blocks. And so yeah. there's an interesting dynamic there because when a person is writing and they get in trouble with their bishop, is it male, is it male domination or is it the application or the um how to say the uh um enforcement of the vow of, of obedience mm -hmm. that is being implemented there that that they themselves voluntarily entered into usually i mean i don't know about these girls that are being sent to the convent i don't know how many times they're going to be voluntarily doing that but but can know, those two can those two things be separated right i mean the vow of obedience is to a is to a male dominated structure right that's right that's right but it is it is an issue of them submitting themselves to that institution of their own will if it's not something that they're doing when they're you know four years old or whatever it is that they were sent there so it isn't always easily separated i'm not going to argue that um but there is some perhaps difference there but an important assumption in the premise there, of course, is that women had will, that women had agency in making this decision, which, I mean, historically, they haven't always, that they mm -hmm. haven't, right? Mm -hmm. Especially, and Kendall talked about this, and Kendall, you can talk more about this, is women from lower classes or mestizo, yeah. mestizo women or indigenous women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I didn't get to look in to Maria Magdalena too much. I want to look more into her, like, after this. Um, but she was definitely one of those like indigenous women that were questioning everything. She didn't know like why these women were allowed to enter into her convent when it was supposed to be exclusive for indigenous women. Um, so mm -hmm. I thought that that was like really interesting. And I definitely want to look more into like the role of indigenous women in convents. Yeah, you and other prominent historians in the field right now. I mean, that's yeah, again, a hot topic, what... Kendall, hot topic. Yeah. Other questions? Kendall, you, you named several secondary sources. Were you <laughs> able to consult uh, any primary sources that helped you with your research? Yeah, so most of my primary sources were Sor Juana's um, works and then a lot of Maria de San Jose and Ursula Suarez. Each of them wrote uh, like an autobiography um, or wrote letters or things like that. So I usually would go into those and like look into those a little bit um, and then compare them with the secondary sources. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Any other questions for Kendall, everybody? Good job, Kendall. Yay. Thank you. All right, that concludes our Women in Colonial Latin America panel, but we're actually going to have our first presenter, the one and only Lexi Clark, um, to begin our second panel before we take a break. Um, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Heiser, and I get to go attend a all faculty wide meeting over Zoom. So that's going to be thrilling. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the meantime, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the meantime, you guys can, you know, take a break, grab some lunch, etc. And we'll, um, after Lexi's, we'll resume um, at 1230 with, I think it's Highland, right? Okay. Uh, is everyone ready for Lexi's big presentation? We're doing a bit of a shift here. We just talked a lot about gender. And now we're going to talk about the role of both science and religion in colonial Latin America. Yay, Lexi. <laughs> All right. This should be easier than your med school uh, online interviews. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can you guys see it all right? Yes. Oh. Okay. So hi, for those who don't know me, I'm Alexis Clark, and today I'll be presenting 
on my senior capstone entitled The New World of Medicine, Syncretism Between Spanish and Indigenous Medical Practices in the Colonial Era of Latin America. A quick outline of what I'll touch on today, I'm going to start with my research question and thesis and with that kind of talk about a little bit of the inspirations for this project and then move into a look at both my secondary and primary sources, which helped me to craft my historical background and my main arguments and then move into some summarizing conclusions. So firstly, my research question is, how did indigenous traditions in health and wellness in pre-Columbian Latin America come to affect the medical practices of both the colonial New World and Spain itself? There are kind of two reasons why I chose this project. I knew going into the prereq last semester that I wanted to do something related to the history of medicine as a history and biology dual degree, applying to medical school right now. Uh, it's really just one of my passions, and so that definitely piqued my interest. And then how I settled upon looking at the effects of indigenous medicine uh, was really during the prereq, it was just so interesting to learn about these indigenous cultures, especially because a lot of the sources that we have to learn about them are um, not traditional in nature, so they're more visual or um, clay figures, things like that. So I thought it was really cool that we could draw these pretty sophisticated conclusions on these civilizations based off of um, artwork or different things that we found in an archaeological setting. So from there, my thesis is that indigenous medical knowledge was of great value to and had a large effect on the medical discourse of the colonial New World and Spain because of centuries of indigenous development with, accesses to, with access to resources unique to the New World prior to European contact and shown through the widespread adoption of various indigenous medical practices in the colonies and Spain itself following contact. This thesis is um, kind of in direct conflict with the Eurocentric narrative that was historically pushed, um, especially from primary sources during that time that the indigenous people were unintellectual and savages. Um, and we actually see those kind of same sentiments with respect to their medical practices. So this project is hoping to prove that that was not really the case. So now to move into a look at my sources, I'll start with my secondary sources and look at them through a historiographical viewpoint. For this, I actually am including people who are from different disciplines other than history. So this is required for multiple reasons. Firstly, the study of indigenous cultures. Uh, it requires to look at people like anthropologists, archeologists, because like I said, that source material is so different. Um, it takes a little bit more sophistication to really analyze it. Next, I also have to include scientist viewpoints, uh, really just the history of medicine in general. Scientists often have opinions on it, uh, but to bring it all together, I'm also including the opinions of a historian. So to start with my anthropologists, I have Bernardo Ortiz de Montiano. He wrote Aztec Medicine, Health and Nutrition in 1990. This book really looks at a broad viewpoint of what indigenous medicine was as a whole. Montiano focuses, though, on kind of being the myth buster of what indigenous medicine is. Uh, he cites a lot of different primary sources from the time of European representations of indigenous medicine. For example, in the Codex Mexicanus, there is included a depiction of a zodiac man. Uh, Montiano looked at indigenous religion and culture and also the European side as well and concluded that that really didn't make sense for indigenous people to have been using this zodiac man for their medical practices. Um, there are various other examples of that through his book, but again, the main points of um, bringing him up are that he took a broad viewpoint to just indigenous medicine as a whole and really laid the foundation for what it was in his earlier work. So then secondly, looking at the scientist viewpoint, we have Xavier Lazoya. He is a specialist in phytomedicine, so plant medicine and that I'm sure inspired his work entitled Natural History and Herbal Medicine in 16th Century America from 2006. 
So I think that taking a step forward in time, we also see a step forward in the specification of the studies. So instead of looking at medicine as a whole, Lazoya looks specifically at herbal remedies and the natural history that allowed for them to come forward. Along the same thought, our historian Martha Few wrote for all of humanity, Mesoamerican and colonial medicine in Enlightenment Guatemala in 2015. She again continues on this trend of specification, looking specifically at both obstetrics and fetal medicine. And then also pictured on the cover of her book, you can see, she also touches on inoculations, um, a historical term for vaccinations that we have today. This again, I think, is the trend in the discourse that we start pretty broad, just trying to figure out what was going on in the first place. And then as we move forward in the timeline, we see more specific studies coming in. So where I hope to fit into this discourse is, like Montiano, I am taking a broad approach, looking at as many aspects of the medical discourse as um, realistically feasible for me and then also acknowledging the contributions of those aspects of indigenous medicine to the broader medical discourse uh, when they came in contact with the European people. So then to move on to my primary sources, I've grouped these into three different categories. Firstly, I have my visual sources. Pictured above is an Incan skull. This actually gives insight into the indigenous knowledge of trauma medicine. The holes that you see in that skull are evidence of trepanations, which is a historical term for craniotomies. Craniotomies are performed to relieve pressure that's built up inside the skull, and that often is a result of trauma to the head of some kind. So again, this just shows evidence that they were performing advanced surgical procedures and were advanced in trauma medicine. Secondly, we have clay figures. These often depict shaman he shaman's healing, giving insight into the kind of intertwining of religion and medicine for the indigenous people. But also with this, they are often carrying medicine bags, which uh, shows evidence for the use of herbal medicine in the indigenous populations. Then from the Europeans per European perspective, we also have herbal illustrations in this visual source category. Uh, these include things from the Royal Botanical Expedition of New Granada. It was done to bring back flora and fauna representations from the New World to Europe, uh, and many of those were medically valuable. Secondly, we have written sources. These are typically of Spanish origin. Uh, the Spanish and European broadly methods of record keeping are a lot more easily translatable, so um, they're a lot more accessible to historians today. Pictured above is an excerpt from the treatise of Ruiz de Alarcón. He actually wrote a complete treatise, a six treaties, just on the health and wellness practices of the indigenous people. As a man of European descent, he cast um, some pretty harsh judgments on indigenous medical practices, at one point calling them logical but not rational. Uh, in short, I kind of took this as him saying there's a method to the madness of indigenous medicine, but it's still madness in his eyes nonetheless. Additionally, though, other than just seeing the judgments that the Europeans were casting upon the medical practices, this does help to lay the foundation for what those indigenous medical practices were in some instances and to prove that they were still being used um, after contact with the European people. Then we have mixed sources. So these include codices like the Codex Mexicanus, which um, above we see the Zodiac Man pictured, as I mentioned earlier. And then also herbals in this category. The Aztec Herbal of 1552 would fit. This is a huge compilation of herbal remedies that the Aztec people had, and it was written by Nahua intellectuals. So while the timing notes that there's probably some European influence involved, uh, it likely is pretty representative of what the indigenous knowledge of herbal medicine was. So now to move into my historical background, I first want to identify both what the state of medicine prior to European contact was in the New World and what that was in Europe. And then I'll talk a little bit about how the history of medicine has been represented since then. 
So firstly, talking about the state of medicine in the new world prior to contact, firstly, they had a vast understanding of herbal remedies. This really can't be exaggerated. Um, if you think about it, the new world, the Americas, have a complete different set of flora and fauna than Europe does. And so they have a completely different method, a completely different system of herbal healing. Um, while it's similar in practice, they have different plants that they're using. So this obviously will be of great value to the Spanish because it represents a huge influx of new medicines to use. Uh, beyond herbal, though, there were also some animal-derived medicines being used. For example, during childbirth, uh, you would ground up the tail of a possum and ingest it, and it would serve as um, like an epidural today, just to relieve pain and um, help ease the process. Secondly, trauma medicine was a point of interest. Specifically in the Aztec and Incan empires, warfare was a huge part of their society, and with warfare comes injuries. And so, like I mentioned earlier, that Incan skull shows that. Uh, but also, this is one point that Monteano notes is actually superior to European medicine, uh, specifically the healing of wounds. The Aztec people would use agave sap to cover the wound, and this would serve both to protect it from things like infection and also to reduce inflammation. So like a Band-Aid and ibuprofen would today. Um, but again, I thought it was really interesting that this was a point of supposed superiority to European medicine. Thirdly, they had a great grasp on human anatomy. Specifically for the Aztec people, they practiced ritual sacrifice and at times ritual cannibalization. And so whenever they were using bodies for sacrifice or preparing them for consumption, they had access to subjects to study anatomy on. In Europe, the study of anatomy was achieved primarily through grave robbing and the study of animals in the early periods. So it was a pretty slow process to figure out what human anatomy actually was. Whereas the the Aztecs had a great access to um, subjects to study at many points. However, with all of this scientifically based medicine, they also had some pretty strong ties to religion and supernatural forces. Uh, almost every single medical practice that they used was coupled with, coupled with a ritual incantation of some kind. This isn't to say that that was completely um, powerless, though. Uh, today, we have what's known as the placebo effect. If a doctor gives you a sugar pill, sugar pill and you think it's healing you, you're likely going to experience some alleviation of symptoms because you just believe that you're going to get better. And I feel that the ritual incantations kind of serve that same purpose. If the belief is there that it's going to heal you, it will likely have some influence on your recovery. So then the state of medicine in Europe prior to contact, they had the emphasis on the four humors. These were blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And they were paired with a wet, dry, cold, hot presentation system. So blood was wet and hot. And so treatment was focused on the balance of these humors. I think probably the most common one that we would all think of is the practice of bloodletting. Uh, but it's important to note that this balance of the four humors was different for every single person. So while bloodletting would be a common practice, it was probably uh, using different methods or different amounts of time that you're doing it for each person to kind of meet that individual need. Um, there had been some focus on magical healing, but again, this was challenged by the Reconquista and the Inquisition, which reaffirmed some of the Christian and Catholic beliefs and uh, really pushed magical healers to the phrase of society. In smaller communities, they were still prevalent, um, but not really in the centralized medicine. And again, to note, I'm referring to the state of medicine in Europe, but this is pretty much equivalent to the state of medicine in Spain. Because of things like the plague and the proximity of powers in Europe, collaboration was not only frequent, but also very necessary. So the medical discourses are pretty much equivalent. So then how the history of medicine was represented following contact. Uh, really, to sum it up, it was just European discovery. They came and discovered all these herbal remedies, and really any advances were attributed to European minds. 
uh, they remove the indigenous people from their knowledge. They just take the knowledge and don't um, acknowledge that it came from indigenous minds. So now to summarize my main arguments. Number one, indigenous medicine was established and successful prior to European contact. Uh, like Alarcon would argue, he agrees that it's established, but he wouldn't agree that it was successful. But looking at the herbal remedies and the different surgical practices and trauma medicine practices and things like that that they used, this was definitely a successful system. They were seeing good results. Um, and obviously there was European interest because of that. So then, secondly, the European colonizers saw value in the medical practices of the indigenous people upon contact. We see this in things like King Philip II's questionnaire, in which he specifically asks about the health and wellness practices of the indigenous people of the Americas and things like their herbal remedies. Also, again, like I mentioned earlier, the Royal Botanical Expedition of New Granada was focused on obtaining herbal remedies and flora and fauna from the New World. Thirdly, indigenous medical practices continued to be used in the Americas during the colonial period. This is most easily traceable um, with their herbal remedies, and also the herbal remedies are a lot more easily removed from their indigenous um, foundations. So these were incorporated a lot easier and more quickly into the broader medical discourse. But there were also still those indigenous pockets, those communities that practiced completely indigenous medicine. Again, Alarcon saw this happening. And um, there's actually some accounts where your people of European descent would resort to going to see indigenous healers because they were not seeing success with the Western forms of medicine. Then lastly, indigenous medical practices were brought to Spain and the broader European continent following contact. Again, with herbal remedies, this is the most easily traceable. Uh, hospitals in Europe actually had greenhouses connected to them, and they would bring back plants from the New World, herbal remedies that were likely obtained from the indigenous people to grow at their hospitals for use there. Um, so the indigenous medicine was not only valuable to the Europeans, but they brought it back and used it. So then some conclusions to wrap up. Again, many of the influences of established indigenous medical practices have been framed as scientific discovery, or again, European discovery uh, from sources from the times. Secondly, in historical documents, indigenous medical practices were misrepresented, leaving behind the sophistication, and instead portraying them as purely spiritualistic. We see this in Alarcon, again, the logical but not rational statement, and many other judgments that are cast upon the uh, spiritual sides of indigenous medicine. And then again, to note that whenever there was a scientifically sound practice, uh, Alarcon would just kind of pass it off as general knowledge, not acknowledging that it was indigenous knowledge. And then lastly, again, to reiterate my, my contribution to the current discourse, I hope, is the acknowledgement of the value of indigenous medical practices while still maintaining a broad approach to the topic. So this is my bibliography, and I'd be happy to field any questions. Yay! All right, questions for Lexi, everybody. Thank you, Lexi. That uh, that was very interesting in, in right along in line with all the other ones we've heard this thus far. Um, was there a um, when you think of herbal kinds of medicines, I think of that as being a more broadly dispersed knowledge that it was kind of um, everybody kind of could do it, if you will. Were there, obviously there must have been some kind of expertise if you have people drilling holes in other people's heads, <laughs> some kind of expertise, but it, do you see the similar sort of thing where you have some people who have expertise, uh, advanced knowledge or whatever, who have this special place within society, while all the, all the while everybody's mom and dad know how to use plant A to take care of, you know, a cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't see anything specifically regarding 
how um, really entrenched that knowledge was to where it would be used just in every home. Mm-hmm. But um, I would assume that it would be generally gener- generationally passed down. Mm-hmm. Um, so likely some of the more tame herbal remedies would be used in the home and they would resort to the use of shamans or other healers uh, in more extreme circumstances. Really with the ink and skull, the only evidence that we have is that ink and skull. We don't have the tools that they mm-hmm. use or really any knowledge of who did it and why or how, but um, okay. Okay. that's really just due to the nature of studying indigenous history, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Lexi, I've, I've got two, well, one, one comment and one question that follows just with what you were talking about. First of all, um, it, it's kind of, um, I don't know, surprising perhaps on my part to see that the Europeans uh, did actually recognize the value of what the indigenous were doing and didn't just discount what they were doing. And in fact, uh, the greenhouses is a really interesting aspect of that um, where you see it physically manifest itself back in in Europe. But the second, the, the question I have for you deals with this, the skull and anthropology and when we when we look at historical sources, one of the things I always like to do when we, you know, gut a book is look at what kind of history and what are the limitations of that history. What, what do we need to be aware of, whether that's oral history or political history or or what have you? Um, we're moving outside of the realm of history to an- anthropology. Um, so so what are the just when we when we take those sources the skull with the holes in it Mm -hmm. um what what are the limitations we have to have what's the caution what's the i mean how how can we proceed you know unless there's a document that said i drilled these holes in the head um assuming the historian is tied to that written word so i'll leave it with you how do we how do we deal with that sort of evidence yeah i think it's definitely a limitation of personally being raised and still maintaining somewhat of a western viewpoint on things whenever we see something like that ink and skull we assume it's a trepanation or craniotomy uh really there's been some pretty intense studies into it seeing that there's actually evidence of healing so these weren't created after death but again still did they realize that drilling those holes were going to relieve the pressure things like that you can't be positive um and so that's why i think for the note on trauma medicine i don't want to rely completely on um things like that inca skull the visual sources can't be the only sources that you're using uh i relied pretty heavily on secondary sources in a lot of these circumstances to people who are much more trained than me in the fields of archaeology and anthropology to analyze that um that's how i kind of tried to remedy it but yeah that's definitely a good point that these visual sources can be taken in many different ways and we can't be positive if we're taking it in the correct one well just just as a follow-up real quickly um do we I presume that's not the only skull that looks like that, that, that we see that widespread across both perhaps space and time, um, which would indicate obviously that this is some sort of practice, but right. mm-hmm. um, yeah, fascinating. Very cool. Very well done. Thank you. Other questions? I had a related question for you, Lexi, and it's something that we've talked about and it makes, and we've all talked about this, studying indigenous history difficult, right? Because the Aztecs at least had codices and stuff, right? But the Incas had no written language. And so it really, first and foremost, it it presents a lot of challenges, especially because a lot of what we have about the life in pre-Columbian Peru, for example, is seen through the eyes of the first generation of Spaniards, right, that come through and document everything. So everything they say, we obviously have to take with a grain of salt, right? Um, But the other important thing, and this 
kind of relates back to Nelson's question, which is that we have to be really careful the kind of stock that we're placing in written sources, mm -hmm. right? And so, and I think that that's something that Lexi has done a really good job with in her research and presentation is that she's really trying to balance the fact that, you know, she's integrating both this indigenous historical perspective and a more westernized historical perspective and balancing the fact that written sources don't necessarily actually provide, you know, they, they're an easier route to information, but they're not necessarily a more accurate um, mm -hmm. way to convey information. So I applaud you, Lexi, in having that kind of balance um, in your in your capstone research, because that's not easy to do. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just add that they, they just to follow up with Dr. Sumner, that they, you're right that they don't, con they convey a certain information that obviously illustrates what the motives of those conquistadors mm -hmm. are. And that is this intentional sort of rewriting of and discounting of, of uh, the indigenous contributions. So um, no, really interesting. Yeah, really interesting, Lexi, really, yeah. Okay, other questions for Lex? Lexi, I have one. So I know that you looked at all indigenous religions or all indigenous um, societies, but I was wondering if one civilization like stood out to you as being more advanced than the others or if they were all like pretty similar with their practices. Good question, Serena. Yeah, yeah really. I tried to look at a pretty broad um, sampling of different indigenous populations, but the one that I had the most information on were the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the most easily accessible to me. So based off of what I saw, I would say them, but also that's probably just due to a lack of information about what the other populations were practicing. So I can't make really a definitive um, statement on who was the most advanced. Uh, Lexi, in light of our earlier presentations, is there any evidence to tell us who the experts and practitioners of medicine were in the indigenous cultures, men or women? Yeah, so we see kind of a mix. Uh, Relying a little bit on Alarcon's treaties again, he notes that in childbirth, uh, women were primarily the ones involved uh, with the kind of traditions of midwifery uh, that we see pretty widespread. Mm -hmm. But um, in other instances, he would refer to the healers as he um, and some she. So it was pretty split at least during the colonial period mm -hmm. but there are also other sources that note that women were involved in the healing processes uh in the pre-columbian period as well so mm -hmm. it was um pretty accessible to both genders it seems very good thank you yeah and as serena previously noted what's interesting about you know the aztecs for example is that childbirth was seen as an act of war right so <laughs> it was women were, were valued in a different way in that childbirth was valued in a different way. And before we conclude, Lexi, I want you to tell Dr. Nelson and Dr. Heiser about how you discussed your capstone presentation in your med school interview. Oh yeah. I, I talked about it at pretty much every single one, I think. Um, at different points in the research process at each one, obviously. But it was definitely a really interesting point to talk about and really got the conversation going, I think. Yay! Well done. Well I know. Done, Lexi, nicely done. Thank you. Her interdisciplinarity will take you far, Lexi. <laughs> okay, other questions for Lexi before we conclude? Will you do it again questions? real quick? <laughs> okay, we'll meet back here. Thomas, do you have a question? Sorry. No, no, I was, I was just making a joke. What, did, what joke did you make? I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Oh, I was, what, were you like, any more questions? I was like, will you do it one more time? <laughs> Meaning the presentation. All right, let's take a break, everybody, but we're going to come back to the same link, okay? Um, and we will be back here at 1230, okay? All right, see you then. Take care, everybody. See you in two hours. Bye. Bye.
going well for you, Jackie. Yes. Yeah, looks like uh, it's gone well. Yes. I've been impressed. Yeah, they're they're doing a great job, especially in light of this crazy circumstances. I think it's awesome. I think it's going very well. Yeah. Yeah. The, the I mean, they don't have an audience in front of them like they would. But yeah. They're doing. It's very, very comfortable. It seems like they seem very comfortable. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're doing great. Good show. This is actually, it's a, it's Good fine show. for presentations, I think, online. It's just harder when you actually have to have a real discussion. It just doesn't work as well in my experience thus far. Mm -hmm. As long mm -hmm. as you're not, mm -hmm. they're not using their phone to present, which makes it a little bit harder. Yeah. Do. But. <laughs> yeah. Right. Is what it is. But, yeah, exactly right. All right. Well, this afternoon, I'm going over to Roy's group. Okay, should I recruit Heiser or Vicky over here then? Or, I'm sorry, Harris or Vicky? Whatever, sure. Okay. I think, yeah, I think Stefan emailed in response. Okay, cool, I'll look. I'll stay, I'll stay with you. Okay, thank you, Heiser. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess we're going okay. over to the Zoom I meeting. know. Uh, last time this crashed my computer, so we'll find out. And I would, I would <laughs> like, I would, I would. Blessing in disguise, perhaps. Yeah. I was just going to say the one thing I would like to know what's going on is. Hold on one second, Nelson. I want to. Um, stop recording. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Stop recording.